Sports are really important vehicles for relationships. We have purpose. We have a why. We bring people together. We connect. I feel like God is our greatest supporter and our greatest coach. This is Rabbi Erez Sherman and Rabbi on the Sidelines. This morning, we are joined by Dave Cohen, former play-by-play -play broadcaster for the New York Yankees and MSG Network, WFAN in New York. College basketball, 1979, was there for the first week of broadcasting college basketball. Syracuse University, within the Syracuse community, has done basically everything. A true legend, but most importantly, my little league coach on the Sherman Park Yankees and a good friend of mine, Dave Cohen, live from Atlanta. Coach Dave, how are you? Am I supposed to call you rabbi or kid? <laughs> yeah, well, you're gonna exactly don't give away the secrets to our audience here. But it's so amazing to uh reconnect. We go way back to when I was a kid, but also your son Andy was one of my best friends, the Syracuse Hebrew Day School. We would ride the bus together, and my best part of the bus rides. We're getting the secrets of Syracuse sports on the way. What was going to happen for the Syracuse Miami game? What was going to happen Syracuse Georgetown? So uh, what I'm doing today is really inspired by the work that you did when I was a kid growing up in upstate New York. So simply thank you. Well, you're very welcome. That was a long time ago. It was a but long the time ago. The memories are still there. Absolutely. And it feels like yesterday. So we're going to go back, speaking about a long time ago, not to Syracuse, but to Coney Island. Coney Island Dave, take us to uh, how that name came about and how that became your name in the industry. Coney Island Dave. Well, I grew up in Coney Island section of Brooklyn, you know, like 100 feet from the beach. And, uh, you know, I always told people where I live, where I grew up, we only went to school a half a day, either 8 to 12 or 12 to 4. We were always on the beach or playing ball. And then many years later, we get to college, and uh, I'm running the radio station sports department. I got a guy named Bob Costas, who is working for me. And then when I get my first professional job as a TV sportscaster, I got him a job as the weatherman. And before yeah. that, I got him a job doing uh, a hockey play-by-play, -play, and then I was the announcer on his shows. And after my big introduction... He would say, thank you very much, Coney Island Dave. And he still calls me every time on the phone, Coney Island. And, and then the conversation continues every single time. So Costas gave you that name. Yes, he gave me that name. That is amazing. That is amazing. Let's talk about Bob Costas for just a moment, his trajectory. And I saw a video of you saying all these people that you work with, and we're going to share that in a moment, from Marty Glickman to Dolph Shays to Mike Tirico to Bob Costas to everybody, how does a trajectory go about like that in the industry, starting at the WAR, WSYR studios on the Syracuse campus and going to national national broadcasting? Well, I, I will simply say Bob is the greatest communicator I have ever uh, heard, met, seen, been around. It doesn't matter what the subject matter is. He is the greatest communicator. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a kind of a key word. It doesn't matter if you're broadcasting sports, or you just saw an accident down the street and you, you ran in and you're telling your friends what you just saw, you have to be able to communicate. As a rabbi to your congregation, as a father to your children, it's communications. And once you know how to do that, once you can be a storyteller, it's just a matter of what are you talking about today? And so talk about that storytelling. When did you realize that you wanted to be a storyteller and what were the keys to get there? I know Marty Glickman was just a big influence in your life and we'll talk about him in a moment as well. Well, growing up in Brooklyn, my mother always had talk radio on all the time. And there was one particular show in the morning, Rambling with Gambling, and they had great newscasters. It wasn't sports, really. It was just conversation. And I realized that they could really have their pulse on the finger of New York. And then, you know, you'd watch baseball on TV and you heard Mel Allen. Mel Allen, Israel from Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And you, you watched and you heard the giant football games on radio. Marty Glickman. I should say. Never was one single second of a Giants home game football ever seen in New York City. They were always blacked out. There was no such thing as the blackout then, but you had to rely on radio. And he was so descriptive and so full of excitement, as Mel Allen was for baseball. 
these guys kind of became the people I look forward to hearing and then eventually to doing what they were doing. I got to work with Marty and he told me yeah. some amazing stories. Mel, I really only met once, but it's a thrill. And Dolph Shays, who at the time was the leading right. scorer in the history of basketball, he came out of the Bronx. So I got to meet all these people, other people like Carmen Basilio, who lived in Syracuse, the world uh, middleweight, welterweight champion. So along the way, my life has kind of been magical. I mean, mm -hmm. I walked across the stage at Carnegie Hall to graduate from high school, Stuyvesant. Later, you get to play Yankee Stadium in Madison Square Garden. And all the people that I've, you know, worked alongside or worked for me or were colleagues on the air, it's simply amazing. I'll tell you, I cannot watch a sports show, a new show, or drama on TV without having work with somebody. It's like every time you turn on a TV, your life is kind of flashing in front of you. And what was your hardest job, the Sherman Park Yankees? Uh, coaching that team was very tough. Let's, very talk about, tough. let's talk about that for a moment. I actually remember the first time you uh, you invited me to, or Andy invited me over to the house, and uh, it was in the garage, and you had a, a baseball attached to like a string, and you literally taught me how to hit a baseball for the first time. And I think it goes to what you just said before, communication, coaching, teaching. You were the ultimate teacher. And actually, I want to say this as well because especially what's going on in the world today, that team was so diverse. In the Jewish sense, there was me, son of a conservative rabbi. There was uh, son of an Orthodox cantor. There was your family. And then there was also um, African-American kids around um, on that team as well. I learned so much on that baseball field that I'm also trying to teach today. So take us to, to Sherman Park for a moment. And what, was, <laughs> what were the lessons that you, were, that you taught us on that field? Well, I don't remember that I was teaching lessons. I was just teaching, you know, the mechanics of baseball and how to get along and how to kind of share. And I always move people around in different positions because when you're in those young leagues and you're on the mound, you're going to get all the action. If you're in the outfield, you're picking daisies or playing in the dirt. So one thing I learned early on, never let people sit out more than an inning. Nice. If you have more than nine players and move them around so everybody gets a chance. Baseball is a great game. You have to come up and take your chance. Nobody can help you when you're hitting. You don't have to hit a home run. You could just move the runner along. And I, I tried to instill that in people that you don't have to be, you know, the star. You could do very small things and contribute to your team. I am still playing competitive baseball, managing a team. I have a game tonight, and it's incredibly gratifying when somebody says, what am I doing wrong? Go, help me. And you just make the slightest tweak from one at-bat to the next. Bend your knee a little. Get your head a little lower. So you're on the right level where the, every ball is going to fall in baseball. In the major leagues, in the little league, every pitch will fall. So if you're standing erect and upright and that ball is falling, you got a longer way to travel with your bat to get to the ball. Sometimes if a guy has a great curveball, move up in the batter's box before that ball falls off the table. It doesn't matter. Little league or major league, it's mm. still the same physics. And that's what I try to instill in people. Well, I do remember trying to make it home <laughs> from third base and hearing you shout, what do you have, a piano on your back? <laughs> the uh, type of runner that I was. So, But uh, it was nice being in the outfield. Thankfully, Sherman Park had four outfielders, right center and <laughs> left center. So we covered we covered all the area, but it was it was an amazing experience. And how, how ironic is that? You're Sherman, and the league was Sherman Park. You we had a guy it. named Yankee, and a few years later, I go to work <laughs> for the Yankees. <laughs> oh, well, I, I would, you know, that's the next documentary after the Glickman one. It's the Sherman Park Yankees for sure. <laughs> So take us to your journey to Syracuse from Coney Island. Is it because that Marty Glickman was there? What was the route there? And like you said, it's interesting because so many connections happen within that small town in upstate New York that really have influenced the sports world and the broadcasting world. I didn't know anything about college. Nobody in my family, nobody had ever gone to college. Mm -hmm. I went to Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan. I traveled an hour and a half each way every day. And when it came time to pick colleges, I put down Cornell and I put down Syracuse. I don't know why. I was a pretty good kicker and punter and a decent pitcher, not very fast. And I guess I learned along the way that Syracuse had this broadcasting background. This is before the famous Newhouse School. And then I learned that uh, there were some people who went there like Glickman, like Hank uh, 
Greenwald, uh, Dick Stockton, Marv Albert. And I said, all right, I'll apply. I got mm -hmm. in. I didn't know what a fraternity was, a sorority. I didn't know anything about college. All you knew was about a minion. Yeah, I went there and uh, met some amazing people. Uh, I ate in a place called the Kosher Kitchen. One guy turned out to be a prolific baseball author, uh, Dan Schlossberg. And he just met some incredible people on campus and especially at the radio station. And when did you realize that then you can take it to the next level? Obviously, with WSYR, for so many, you were uh, Cable 13. You were the voice broadcasting yeah. to me. Um, what was that journey? Well, while, while I was in college and then I got hired to do professional hockey, I said, you know, I think I can do this uh, for a living. And it, at the age of 21, I was on TV. And this is in the days when there were only three TV stations. So there weren't a lot of jobs. So we did TV and radio simultaneously. There were times when I would have to be on the TV set right at 11 o'clock, then be on radio at 11.15, then run around before the era of electronic graphics where you had to put the numbers on a menu board like they have at the front of many synagogues and churches, you know, the black felt with the yeah. white numbers. And on the weekends, you had to stick up all the college football teams and they would be superimposed on TV. And sometimes the tape would dry out and the names would fall off to be a score with no names. Sometimes the menu board would turn on its own. There were all sorts of crazy things that used to happen back in those early days of unsophisticated TV. But the one thing, we didn't have teleprompters and I was a good storyteller. So I always told people, being on the air is telling a series of 15 second stories. You don't need any cue cards. You don't need a teleprompter to tell a joke. I don't need a teleprompter to tell you what in 15 seconds what happened in the game tonight. So it's a series of 15 second stories. And I always tell all the people I've coached and tutored in broadcasting, don't rely on something on print. Just tell it. And you'll nice. you'll never say it the same way verbatim. Never. But you won't lose the punchline or the storyline. Is there a favorite story or moment of those Syracuse days, either football, basketball, or even the Syracuse Chiefs that uh, comes to mind that you had the honor of telling the public? Well, the uh, the final game of the 87 regular season, Syracuse Beach, West Virginia, on yeah. a two-point conversion. And earlier that day, my older son had run in the high school cross-country championships. It was a snowy November day in Syracuse. So it was a long day, and it culminated with that successful two-point conversion and a perfect season. In terms of uh, basketball, the triple overtime game, who was at Syracuse and UConn, in the very early days of the Big East was absolutely amazing. And my favorite Syracuse Chiefs story is I used to pitch batting practice for Bobby Cox when he was wow. managing. Wow. Bobby Cox, who went on to great, you know, Hall of Fame career for the Atlanta Braves. So I tell everybody, Maddox, Smat, uh, Smoltz, and Glavin, I pitched for Bobby Cox way before them. Wow. Way before them. <laughs> Actually, next week we have uh, Jeff Mangrum, who was the um, free safety on that team of 1987 and happened yep. to be my history teacher as well um, in oh, Mount wow. Hill. Um, so we're going to look at a quick uh, highlight of Dave Cohen's magical life as you say and the people that inspired him and the people that he has continued to inspire marty glickman the jewish sprinter who looked hitler in the eye at the 36 berlin olympics but was not allowed to compete the first athlete to go into broadcasting he invented basketball play-by-play -play. how about that mel allen israel from birmingham voice of the yankees and later this week in baseball Dolph Shays, out of the Bronx, from DeWitt Clinton and NYU, helped Syracuse win the NBA championship in 1955. His son Danny played 18 years in the NBA. Marv Albert was Marty Glickman's protege, and the reason I went to Syracuse, followed by Bob Costas, Mike Tirico, and many others. Some, like me, have actually strayed from sportscasting. When dealing with cancer, finding the right support is just as important as getting the right treatment. Glory Road. 
It's Texas Western College against the University of Kentucky for the NCAA championship. In an unprecedented move, Coach Haskins is starting five Negro players. That's like a spit in the face to us. First in NCAA championship history. And in Tree Hill, North Carolina, the local high school basketball team, the Ravens, began their season with a bench-clearing brawl, which wouldn't be that noteworthy, except this brawl pitted the Ravens against the Ravens. <laughs> yes, yes, y'all. You know what time it is. It's time for Sports Sense. And here's your host, Guy Young. And right now it looks like it's come down to a two-man race. Two, one, he's there. He reaches for the flag. Hi again, everybody. I'm Dave Cohen, joined by former major leaguer and NFL player Brian Jordan. Now imagine what you can do with all the tax-free money you'll receive with a reverse mortgage. Rolex collection? No. Wife's jewelry? No way. Classic car? I don't think so. Your assets have no value. <laughs> and finally, my wife Kathleen. She is the face of Mallory on the animated series Archer. Everything. Well, you have done everything. Um, take us to that moment of actually first 1979 of college basketball. Who knew what ESPN would grow into? What was your journey to that moment? Who was playing in that game? And what did you think at that time that it would become? Well, I get a call in the middle of the week. You know, I had been doing basketball play by play in Syracuse. I get a call from this outfit nobody had ever heard of. And they said, hey, can you come and do basketball play-by-play -play of UConn against Yale? Wow. On a Saturday night. And I said, sure. And, you know, I flew to Hartford, drove in a rental car to uh, Stores, Connecticut, and ended up doing Yale-UConn with the analyst for the Knicks, uh, John Andres. Hmm. And we did that game. And then I said, well, I want to see what this place looks like. So I drove from Stores to uh, uh from uh, yeah from uh the university of connecticut to espn in bristol in the middle of the night and i come around the hill and i see these things that look like a hard-boiled egg sliced on its axis they were satellite dishes and lo and behold uh that was december 1st 1979 uh i did games in basketball later college baseball football soccer, lacrosse, track and field, rowing, women's basketball, boxing, wrestling. I think, unofficially, I might have the record for the most different sports at ESPN. All ESPN. Wow, that's amazing. And that was, you know, one network, not a ESPN, ESPN2, ESPNU, right. ESPN+. Plus. So, exactly. That's amazing. So let's go to the faith aspect, because anybody can ask you about the amazing sports accomplishments. But as I know you as a human being and as a observant Jew, that has never left you. Um, not just the name Cohen, but I've seen you in ritual practice. I, in fact, have tasted your matzah brai on Herbert Road as well. Um, how has that journey followed you? And how have you not been able to sacrifice the ritual and observant lifestyle for the passion and if you wish rituals of sports as well well like i said i was raised in coney island in an apartment i was the oldest of three children my mother ran a strictly kosher household and outside the house as well and i still maintain that to this day uh, but when i think back now we didn't we had you know she was very fanatical about lighting candles on time and having the kosher but we we didn't even have a kiddish or a blessing over the bread. They were not knowledgeable in Hebrew or much beyond observing the Sabbath and keeping kosher. And the thing about keeping kosher is it always reminds you every time you go to eat, you know, where your roots are, what, where you're from. And so that has always, always stayed with me, giving me a fair amount of discipline as well. And, uh, Later on, when I was, I don't know, nine or so, I started going to Hebrew school four days a week. I learned Hebrew and I learned about, you know, the blessings and the customs and was able to bring a lot of that to my house, uh, you know. Uh, but I, I think also I taught myself to swim. I taught myself how to ride a bike. 
I taught myself how to pitch and play ball. So a lot of a lot of my stuff is self-taught. But my sisters had the benefit of, uh, you know, growing up in a more Hamish, should I say, uh, surrounding because, you know, we were able to integrate that. So as an adult going away to college, I was able to maintain that. Never, never will work on, um, you know, the high holidays for sure. Um, and always find a way to wherever I am to, to get to synagogue, if it's a, a major holiday or even like the feast past of the firstborn, you know, finding a place. And uh, I, I'll tell you one of the funniest stories, if I can just jump yeah, ahead please. here. It's, um, opening day for the Yankees or the opening series, I think it was 96. We're in Cleveland and it's the first night of Passover. I'm not going to be home with my family to do the Seder. And I, I find out where I can get a kosher for Passover meal, have it at the hotel. And I tell them at the hotel after this game around 11 o'clock, I'm going to come, come and call down to the desk and you can send up, you know, heat the meal, leave it in the foil, just <laughs> it up and have room service, bring it up. So it's about 1130. I do. I, I call them up and say in 20 minutes, bring it up. And I start the Seder and I get to the part of the yeah. meal. Knock, knock on the door. Here comes the room service guy, you know, with a cart. He opens the door and he, he, he wheels it in. And, you know, those metal, those round metal covers yeah, that are on the, on the dishes. So I'm looking. I go, wow, there's two of these. Did I, I, I only sent him one meal. So he comes in and he lifts up the one. And it's my entree that's heated up, still in the foil. And I lift up. The other one, and it's a plate full of rolls and bread. <laughs> <laughs> I go to these great lengths to have Passover. I said, excuse me, you could just take this back. That's amazing. And who won the game? Uh, I think Cleveland won. It was a cold night. I don't remember anything about well, it. Well, I think that's actually an amazing point, right? You remember the Pesach experience, but you don't remember right. who won the game. And in terms yeah. of, you know, the priorities and how that works, take us to Seoul in the Olympics, because I know there was also a moment of uh, faith and ritual there as well. Yeah, in Seoul, we were there for the Summer Olympics that were in September, and I knew going that, geez, I'd be there for the high holy days for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I told ABC, who I was working for ABC Radio, I, I would need Definitely would not work on uh, Rosh Hashanah and I need time to go to services on, I, I would not work on Yom Kippur and needed time to go to services Rosh Hashanah. Uh, no, I think, no, as I remember now, Rosh Hashanah was back in the States, Yom Kippur would be during the Olympics. And they said, absolutely fine. And the wow. U.S. Army, because of all the Jews who were there participating and covering the Olympics, they brought in a rabbi from the Philippines to Seoul, mm. South Korea. They told us, if you don't want to travel on Yom Kippur, we'll put you up in the barracks so you can walk right to services, which they wow. did. We had services. I think I ended up maybe doing the Haftorah, uh, Yona, on, on uh, Yom Kippur afternoon. And then the U.S. Army put on an incredible breakfast with like 300 people. And here we were, it was 300 Jews from around the world, but not the Israelis because they were protected in their own enclave in the Olympic village. So it was just a remarkable experience. Yom Kippur in Korea, totally kosher and by the book. No, it's amazing. I, I call this podcast uh, the intersection of sports and faith, the stories that you don't hear on TV. And as yeah. I'm speaking with broadcasters and athletes and owners and managers, and you hear the faith that in fact drives them to live their life, even while there's important moments going on the field. Yankees, and uh, talk about how you got to Yankee Stadium. And then before we do that, we're going to share a little clip of Dave Cohen, play-by-play -play -play for the Doc Gooden no-hitter. Not many people get to watch a Yankee stadium, but now to call a no-hitter, take us through that. Well, you know, uh, I was under that superstition that you don't mention the no-hitter, and they killed me in the newspapers for that. 
Uh, I was a huge fan of, of pitching, especially, and I knew all about no hitters and who had thrown no hitters. I can remember in 1964 being on the beach at Coney Island and Jim Bunning on Father's Day pitched a perfect game against my Mets. And uh, I can remember, you know, listening on the beach and, yeah, everybody's doing their own thing on the beach, but by the end of the game, it was like one giant radio. Transistor radios were in their infancy, and everybody, it seemed, baseball fan or not, was tuned into that. So no hitters were always a big thing of mine, and I always thought I was a jinx. I'd shut it off if I was watching at home, but here I was in a position to do it, and uh, it's a thrill. I have a picture of me and, and Doc behind me. Uh, you know, I had... I had worked for the Mets 10 years before he was there and strawberry was there. And, uh, I was fortunate the broadcast won an Emmy award. So I had that little statue behind me and, uh, you know, yesterday it was a no hitter in the major leagues again. Now exactly. the list has grown a lot more perfect games. My namesake, David Cohn. Yeah. Tell us about that. I love that story. Oh, he pitched a perfect game after I had been with the Yankees. This is a great story. Uh, we're broadcasting. We're in Minnesota. And we weren't, it was a Friday night. We weren't broadcasting on Friday night. It was a Channel 11 game in New York. I was on MSG. So uh, I'm at the ballpark and I hurt my knee. I was limping around. All the players saw me and all the team personnel saw me. I said, oh, I'm going to go back to the hotel and watch the game there. That night, the Yankees make a trade with Toronto and they bring David Cohn to New York. So he's flying in from Toronto, and I'm in bed in a hotel with ice on my knee. I get a call about 1 in the morning from the traveling secretary of the Yankees. He says, uh, David, I go, yeah. He goes, just wanted to make sure you got to the hotel okay. And I'm thinking, oh, thank you very much. You saw me limping around at the stadium, very <laughs> conscientious. And he's going on and on, and he says to me, and by the way, in case nobody's told you yet, you're the starting pitcher tomorrow night. Starting pitcher? <laughs> I, I can't even walk. He goes, what do you mean? And at that point, I realized they connected him to the wrong room. Instead of David Cohen, he went to David Cohen. So the next night, I'm in, I'm on the air from Minnesota. Cohen's in uniform. And he and I had first met 10 years before in 1987 with the Mets when wow. we did a little bit about a play on our name. So he remembers that. I remember that. I tell that whole story Saturday night. Sunday, we weren't broadcasting. I fly back to New York. Now my leg is really swollen. Um, I'm staying in a hotel near Central Park, and I say, well, I'm going to go into the park and go to the uh, the pool and put my leg in the water and see if I can knock some of the swelling down. Well, little did I know at the time, in 96, there was no vehicular traffic in Central Park on Sundays, and uh, I couldn't take a cab to go the two miles or whatever it was to get to the pool. So I plop down on a bench and my knee is killing me. And there's a guy sitting next to me with his New York Times and he's buried in the New York Times. He doesn't know I'm sitting next to him. He's not aware of anything. After about 20 minutes, he puts down his New York Times, looks over and goes, Dave, that was a great story you told last night about wow. getting mixed up with David Cohen. Who do you think it was? Regis Philbin. Oh, nice. Regis nice. Philbin, who's like an incredible Yankee fan and sports fan, he then goes on his show on Monday morning, and he retells the story of meeting me in Central Park. And my wife is back in Atlanta. I'm in New York. And all her girlfriends are calling her and say, you're not going to believe this. Regis is talking about your husband. She has no idea what's going on. She can't watch the Yankee telecast. She wasn't watching Regis that morning. So it's just amazing how many people watch games and and get to know you and, and they treat you like a friend. Well, I'll call it a moment of beshert because on my desk here, I have this picture and it says, to Erez, my rabbi to be, Regis Philbin. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I met him while I was a rabbinic intern in Temple Shalom of Greenwich, Connecticut. And... Uh, I guess I became his rabbi and you became his broadcaster, all out of the <laughs> shtetl of upstate New York in Syracuse. This is amazing. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so talk about that Yankee team for a moment. Who, like, what was it like to be around guys like Jeter and uh, Bernie Williams and well, all those guys? And I know you, you know, you were doing the Columbus Clippers games and with the Chiefs, you saw those guys come up. What is it like to deal with them on that level? 
Uh, I don't remember doing any of those Columbus Clipper games with those guys there. I'm holding up my Yankee hat that has the Jeter Hall of Fame logo on it uh, because they never had the ceremony last year. And I have to wear this hat tonight in my game. See, I even got my name uh, uh, inscribed on there. Uh, the most amazing thing was the day Derek Jeter and who was the Romero Mendoza get called up. The Yankees are in Seattle. Here come these two guys into the clubhouse. The, the veterans like Strawberry and Boggs, they're playing a game of cards and slapping down cards on the table. In walks Jeter and Mendoza. Mendoza crawls into a locker and goes to sleep. In the locker, Jeter makes himself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Wow. Here are these grizzled veterans playing card games for high stakes. He's eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Everywhere we go, he always calls me Mr. Cohen, Mr. Cohen. Um, Jeter does. Jeter does, yeah. Wow. Wow. And uh, uh, I'll remember that season. We Actually, we flew back from Seattle that road trip. And I don't know if it was 95 or 96. Don Manningly had a problem with his eyes. It was 95 because he was retired after that. I get on the plane. I was. I never. I didn't fly with the team. I flew commercial. I get on the plane, and my seats were in first class. On walks Don Mattingly, and he's walking past first class to the back. Of the I go, oh my goodness! I went back and it's Don. Please take my seat. I mean, this is a guy who probably should be in the Hall of Fame, but mm -hmm. to see him pass me to go to coach, and then on that '96 team, that's when um, uh, Mariano Rivera was a starting pitcher, you know? And uh, maybe he was a starter the year before uh, under Buck Showalter. But when Joe Torre got there, they said, oh, this guy's not a starter. This guy is – he was a setup man in 96, eventually, to be the closer. But I do remember one night when he had pitched in Anaheim as a starter and he got knocked around after like two or three innings – and he came back in the hotel, and his room was right down the corridor from mine. He was holding his head down. I said, Mariano, come on, man. Hold your head up high. You've got great stuff. You're going to be pretty successful in this game. This is 96. Wow. Who would have ever thought that of all the players in the history of baseball, he'd be the only unanimous choice for the Hall of Fame? And it's pretty simple when you think about it. Nobody had ever done his job, his role, better, longer, and was always the best. Mm -hmm. Not Ty Cobb, not Hank Aaron. You could argue Willie Mays. You could have an argument for everybody else at every position except Mariano Rivera, the best reliever ever. So on that team, faith in sports, did you see any type of faith in the clubhouse, on the field, I'm talking to a lot of college basketball people. They talk about how, you know, prayers before the game or inspiration between coaches and players, trust between players and managers. What is there faith within the major league baseball? Not the ritual and the Seder and the Yom Kippur stories, but just a more um, feeling of faith that, that pervades within in professional sports. I think it was a collective feeling on that Yankee team because Joe Torrey's older brother, Frank Torrey, had severe heart problems and eventually underwent a, uh, a heart transplant, which prolonged his life. And Joe Torre was from Brooklyn. Like my father, he was a Giants fan in Brooklyn, who ended up you know, playing in St. Louis and playing in Atlanta and managing in various places. And then he comes to the Yankees as a manager who had failed, but now he had the task of bringing together this uh, disparate group we had, you know, white players. We had black players. We had Hispanic players. And I think there was something that was kind of religious about Joe and his brother's health struggles and the nun that he mm -hmm. knew from Brooklyn. And there wasn't any overt, you know, religion brought into the picture. But I think he was kind of a father figure. And with Don Zimmer was there with him. Mel Stottlemyre was, yeah, uh, was there. Uh, there were a lot of veterans, Willie Randolph, people, again, diversity and just darn good human beings, decent, mm -hmm. decent people. Nice. 
So I want to talk lastly about going back to Marty Glickman again, not just as a mentor, but he did after watching. And if you haven't seen the documentary, Marty Glickman, it's, it's out on Amazon uh, this past week. It's an amazing, amazing story. Um, obviously one of the best broadcasters of all time really creates play by play basketball and the different terms that we hear today. But uh, you did a talk back with the uh, producer or, or director, James Friedman. Um, and I have a little clip here that I want to share and we'll talk about that. His voice had energy and gravitas and importance to it. So when you heard a broadcast that Marty was doing, you paid extra attention. Like somebody said, when it came on the dial, you didn't dare, you know, go up or down the dial. You stopped there and listened to him. And then, of course, uh, what he did with the high schools. And I was fortunate that uh, one time my high school was on and I had a broken arm and I weaseled my way into the broadcast booth to spot for him to help him during the football game and then later on as a professional I got to broadcast I think in 1984 the New York State High School Basketball Championships and he was essentially my color man and uh, you know during the preparation for that broadcast just like uh, some of the announcers would tell you Marv Albert would tell you, you know be yourself um, use simple language that everybody can understand uh, use if you have interesting tidbits and sidebars you know use it at the most appropriate time but the one thing about Marty that sets him apart from, I think, just about anybody else, because he was so fast as a runner, he could process information faster than any broadcaster I've ever seen or heard since. And uh, when he was doing a football game, you'd go, the handoff to Friedman, it goes off the right side for two, three, four, five yards. I mean, literally, as somebody said, it was like he was attached to the ball. And I don't think anybody's ever come close to doing that. So he, you know, in the limited uh, times that I, I spent with him, you know, he would pass along uh, certain little tidbits. But I, I just got to get this in. The thing that's most amazing as, as, a, as a Jew, um, when you realize, you know, six million people perished in the Holocaust, here's a guy, how many people can say this? How many people can say, as a Jew, I walked in front of Adolf Hitler looked him in the eye, and lived to tell about it. I mean, so when you meet Marty Glickman later in life and you realize, oh my goodness, the role that this man has played in history and, and being there at the time by virtue of his being an incredible athlete, just the whole story is, it's hard to even put a word, an adjective to it. So it's interesting because at the, uh, at the end of that film, Marty Glickman returns years and years and years later to that Olympic stadium where he uh, went face to face with Hitler and stood exactly where Hitler stood. And I remember those words. He said, I'm here and he's not. Give me the chills just saying that. Yeah. What's the and significance just, of that moment? Just to elaborate on that, <clears throat> Marty Glickman, Sam Stoller were the two fastest white people in America. They happened to be Jewish, Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf. The two fastest together, they formed the four by one hundred meter relay. Right. Glickman and Stoller were not allowed to run in that uh, event. Not allowed to run at all. They never competed in the Berlin Olympics because they thought it was bad enough for blacks to win in front of Hitler. They didn't want Jews. The coach of the U.S. team and Avery Brundage, who was the head of the U.S. Olympic Committee, Nazi sympathizers. Uh, after the Olympics, they set the world record of the four by 100 meter relay. But to yeah. this, they're the only two Olympians on any sport, any team, who never got to compete one second at the site of their Olympic Games. Not relay, not prelims, not heats, nothing, because they were Jewish. And he wasn't afraid, just as you said in that interview, you're not afraid to say who you are behind the camera. How important is that today? We're talking about racial tension, anti-Semitism. What can be done in a beautiful way to, sh as you said in the beginning, 15 second stories for the country, for the world to see who these people are as human beings and not just as athletes and broadcasters? Well, I think to care about uh, your fellow man. You know, in New York growing up, it was so crowded. But you learn to respect the person next to you. If you're in an elevator, if you're on the subway, on a bus, walking down the street, you always had respect and a concern for your fellow man or woman's safety. 
and their dignity. And I think that's true about uh, New Yorkers in particular. And during the early stages of the pandemic, I think it's why, you know, New York got their act together because people cared about others. In some places in the country, it was about, oh, my personal freedom, my liberty, my this, my that. In crowded New York, it was about everybody else. Mm. So true. It's so true. And who do you see as, and actually one last question from the crowd first, a question from the audience, your favorite broadcaster of all time other than you? <laughs> well, Marty and, and Mel, certainly. Uh, Bob Costas is uh, the greatest communicator. Uh, the, the, the guy who can do play-by-play -play of more sports at a network level than anybody I know is Sean McDonough. Mike nice. Tirico is a phenomenal host. Uh, so there's, they're all five tool players, Bob, most especially, Costas. Mm -hmm. He is the ultimate five tool player. He can do play by play, color, analysis, opinion, commentary. Very few people can do all of that and be a very gregarious host. Al Michaels, certainly to a degree, and another uh, Jewish broadcaster. Um, but it's just amazing, you know, the people that I met in broadcasting and then i transitioned into uh, uh acting and in, in yeah. film and tv and uh you know that's been a, a kick there's two movies i'm in i'm always typecast of course as a sportscaster two movies due to glory come out. road and uh well glory road uh with uh josh lucas and john voight uh then there was trouble with the curve with uh, clint eastwood oh quick clint eastwood story can i tell it of course East, Eastwood says the producers in a meeting here in Atlanta were filming right down the street from me where my son Andrew went to high school. And uh, the producers say, Clint, we're really doing a good job. We're staying right on schedule. And if we finish by Friday, everybody can go home for uh, Easter and Passover. And Clint Eastwood looks in and goes, Passover? In the Clint Eastwood voice, Passover? My best friend growing up was a Jewish kid. Who lived across the street and he used to bring me over matzah the best crackers i've ever tasted <laughs> i love matzah i mean can you imagine hearing dirty harry clint eastwood say i love matzah that's amazing <laughs> that is that is amazing uh, what do you, who, who do you see as the next marty glick being the next person that will rise up not just in the sports world but also to make a difference in our society is there anybody out there right now well, you know, somebody in politics who's who's really has struck me as the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, uh -huh. because I didn't know much about him. But, you know, since he was appointed, he talked about his family and the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And if you hear him speak, I don't care whether you're a liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat. He's so well spoken and so sincere that it kind of uh, reinforces my belief in mankind and humanity. Mm -hmm. Nice. An Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State. Nice. And last question, sitting in L.A., went to my first Dodger game with my kid last week. Uh, saw a couple of pictures with you and Lasorda. You've obviously been out here to some of those games as well. What's your prediction for the Dodgers this coming year? Are they going back to the World Series, or uh, what's going to happen there? Uh, it's going to be it's going to be tough. Getting to the World Series is tough. Uh, I haven't seen enough of the season yet. I I don't even know how that game turned out with the Cubs last night. I turned it off in the 11th inning. Did yeah. they win? No, I'm not sure yet. But somebody uh, from Atlanta who is in my yes. congregation is the president of your Dodgers, Stan. That is true. That is true. He was a guest. He's a wonderful guy. Terrific family. He has one son who's extremely from out there in, in Los Angeles. Nice. So you need to get him as a guest. <laughs> well, it is an honor to have you as a guest, uh, not just a guest, but really as a chavruta, as a study partner. Thankfully, with Zoom, I've been able to also watch you daven and lead some services at B'nai Torah. I know your former rabbi, Rabbi Eitan Kenter, a former roommate of mine, was on here and said he knows these guys here as well. So we are honored to have had you. Coach Dave Cohen, a really just a wonderful, amazing broadcaster, actor, voiceover as you said, a mensch, a good, good, good person that you've surrounded your people. Your, you have been surrounded by them, but most importantly, we have been surrounded by you as well. So thank you for being our guest on Rabbi on the Sidelines, Intersection of Sports and Faith.